Christ came to do the will of the Father, and then Antichrist would come to do uh, everything that he can to defy the will of God and, and go against the will of God. Christ came and he wrought miracles through the Holy Spirit, and we find that when Antichrist comes, he's going to do the miracles that he does and the power of Satan. And it's really amazing uh, when you see some of the things that he does. Uh, Christ submitted himself to the Father. Antichrist would defy God. Christ humbled himself. Antichrist exalts himself. Christ ministered to the needy. Antichrist will make people needy. Uh, Christ was rejected by men. Antichrist will be accepted by man. And then finally, Christ was received up into heaven, and yet Antichrist will descend into the bottomless pit and the lake of fire one day. And so uh, it's kind of just a, a quick overview of, of the ministry of Antichrist. We'll get into more of that in just a minute. But let's look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Uh, i got one more page to go over. Let's see. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Bible says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full. Remember when I told you last week in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there's going to be a great apostasy. He says, uh, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Now that's, that's quite interesting, by peace destroy many, because he's going to come in and he's going to be a very charismatic character, and people are going to like him of all walks of life. It's hard to imagine that somebody could do that, but uh, he will. Uh, he's, he's going to seem to have all the answers. He would be almost like an Elon Musk of sorts or... Uh, you know, uh, one of these kind of characters everybody's looking to for answers, uh, but he'll, he'll start out with peace and then cause war. And uh, that's, by peace he shall destroy many. Uh, he shall also stand up against the prince of, uh, prince of princes, which would be Jesus Christ, but he shall be broken without hand. And the visions of the evening, the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true, wherefore, shut Thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days afterwards, and I rose up and did the king's business and was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. And uh, it's, it's really interesting. We know that it's talking about that period of time. Sometimes people uh, have a confusion about uh, the time period that Daniel was writing because he's seeing things far into the future. Some of it will be alluded to of, of Antioch Epiphanes, and uh, he was a, a treacherous king, uh, a treacherous guy. And uh, he's, during the time period of the Maccabeans, and, and you see that in first and second Maccabeans, it's in the, the Apocrypha books, Catholic writings, and that kind of thing. But uh, nonetheless, he was a real character, and people thought that he was the Antichrist, but it's, it's picturing something far more beyond that. How do we know that? Well, because of verse 19, he says, And behold, I will... Make thee to know uh, what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For that time, for the time appointed, uh, the end shall be. And so we recognize not only does it, it point to something that's in part, but it hasn't come to the full completion yet. And, and, and a lot of things that God is showing Daniel, whether it's Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, uh, chapter 11. And in those chapters, you know, we can see some of those things in part, but the fullness of it is going to be when the Antichrist comes in and he has his, his ministry. And so um, it's important to understand that. Daniel has so many, he was blessed by God. And many things he didn't understand, and he confesses that. Uh, many times he would fast and pray for days on end, and God would come and it would show him what exactly what he was going to do, what God's plan is for his people. Well, that was their concern because they're in captivity. God, what is your plan for us? Uh, immediately, I mean, after the 70 years, of course, they would be brought in and they would set up their, their temple and do worship and try to restore life as normal. But, but God wanted to show them a, a, a broader overview of what was going to happen. God still had a plan. In fact, uh, Paul writes over in Romans chapter, I think it's Romans chapter 11, says that blindness has happened unto the, unto the Israelites, unto the Jewish people, until the fullness of the time, until the Gentiles become in full. 
God had a plan, and he was going to save his people. We can look at that later on if you like, but it's over in Romans chapter 11, and uh, I'm preaching through the book of Romans, and so we'll eventually come to that anyway. But it's interesting what God is doing here, and he's specifically dealing with the people of Israel in the, in the tribulation period, but he's deal, also dealing with the whole world, the whole world. Sant- Antichrist wants to do everything that he can to destroy the Jewish people. He just hates the Jewish people. And it's crazy. It's crazy that the, the, the hatred that we see, even presently today, the anti-Semitism, but yet God loves the Jewish people. He loves the Jewish people. And he's trying to do everything that he can to destroy them. So uh, I, I'll just pray and we'll get into the lesson for this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much. I pray you do open our eyes to what your scripture says. Lord, prophecy is sometimes a hard subject. And we pray that you just give us a complete understanding. I pray that you just help me to break this down in a way that makes sense. And may you just restore hope and joy in our hearts as we see what's coming. At the end of the day, we know that you want to come and set up your your kingdom. And uh, we're very thankful for the fact that we know that everything is in your control. Lord, you're still sitting upon the throne. And uh, we can have hope and peace and joy. We can have sunshine in our souls today. And for that, we're glad. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, you know, the Bible is a complex book. And just as I mentioned there in my prayer, when it comes to the area of prophecy, there's so many different ideas. You could could go and you could Google it and you could have every idea under the sun of of man. You know, they have all these ideas. You know, this is what I think prophecy is going to happen. And, of course, they're predicting dates and and things of when, oh, Christ is coming at this time, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. Why? Because of prophecy. And uh, sometimes they'll say, well, I know that Donald Trump is going to be reelected because the Lord showed it to me, and this is going to be fulfilling a prophecy. And they have all these weird ideas about prophecy. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. And, uh, but we're going to take the Bible for our rule book of what prophecy has to say. We're not going to go by these wild ideas that are out there because God has shown us from the Word of God what we can expect at the end times. And so the Bible is our rule book, and we don't have to be confused and abused today exactly what God wants to accomplish here in the face of this earth because God doesn't, He's not the author of confusion. That's the devil. Uh, God here, Jesus Christ, God, He is the author of peace, of order not of confusion, and so we, we, we understand that this morning. And I, I don't, again, I don't have claim to have all the answers. Sometimes when I look at the Bible and I'm reading through, I, I tell Sarah all the time, I said, there are just some things that are out there even I don't understand, and I have a hard time putting it all together. And um, is, every one of us is going to struggle with that. Paul says, you know, uh, what was it, uh, First, Second Peter it says, even Paul wrote some things that are hard to be understood. And, um, but we're not to wrestle them out of context and twist them to our own destruction. But we'll teach the Word of God to the faithfully and to the best of my ability and give God all the glory. And this morning, I want to just teach on for just a moment, uh, Satan's Superman, all right? And essentially, that's what he is. He, he seems to have all the answers. And he's going to do many miracles and signs and wonders. He's essentially Satan's Superman this morning. And for the Sunday school hour, we want to look at the person and work of Antichrist. There have been some estimates, 40 billion people on the face of this earth since Adam and Eve. I, I don't know how they come up with that number. You know what I mean? Uh, it could be way more than that as far as I'm concerned. There's just a lot of people that's been here and come and gone. Uh, but many, many people lived on the face of this earth since Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. Since that time, the world has witnessed the advent of many talented and uh, individuals. In fact, we've seen many of them uh, written in the pages of history. Alexander the Great is, is one of them. He, he is one guy who seems to astound me about how much he had accomplished in a short time of his life. I think he died at 29 years of age, and yet he conquered the known world. There, there have been many talented, smart, intellectual people who have accomplished great things with it, and people look to for answers But none will do more than what Antichrist is going to do when he comes on the face of this earth and 
he is going to come with not only the, the, the charisma, it seems like he has every talent under, under the sun, you know what I mean? Military power, intelligence, uh, he's going to have all the government's answers, he's going to have the, the answers to the world, world currency, he's going to be better than Taylor Swift, he's going to have the better than the YouTubers and their, their personal influences and the best life coach that there ever is, and, and people are going to turn to him and they're going to be deceived by him. So to be powerful, deceitful, intelligent, brutal, ruthless, satanic in nature. And he will represent the pinnacle of all that man can achieve apart from God. And again, you see from the very beginning, Nimrod. Uh, people, he was one of those ones that uh, from the very beginning that people looked to. But every, every once in a while you see these characters arise to power. Uh, Hitler was one of those who rose to power. The uh, only reason, you know, other than the fact we know he's not Antichrist, but uh, Hitler never, well, he started out promising peace, didn't he? Started out promising peace, but he was not a, a person of peace. He will literally be Satan's Superman, and we'll see this from the Bible. So the appearance of Satan's Superman, we find it in verse 23 of our text. It says, in the latter time the, of, of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king, a fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. There's going to be many kings during this period of time, but essentially they're all going to uh, come under one rule eventually, and there's going to be one king that's going to rise above all the others, and there's this king of fierce countenance. Why do they call him a king of fierce countenance? I don't know, um, because he's also known as a, a person of peace as well. But he's going to be a king of fierce countenance. A fierce king will stand up. Uh, and what are the signs of his coming? We, we looked at them a little bit last week. And we know that there are some signs that we can look to. Paul was trying to comfort the, the Thessalonian believers. Because they thought that they had missed the rapture, and they thought that they were in the midst of the tribulation period. And Paul tells them, he says, well, that, not, that time's not going to come until there's going to come first a great apostasy, and then there's going to come Antichrist, and then at the end of the tribulation period, the, uh, the, the Armageddon, the great battle of Armageddon, Gog and Magog, all those coming together, Armageddon, will come the appearing of Christ. And we'll find it, you know, again, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit there, but you, you see some of those signs that we have there. And I'm certain, again, I'm certain that no man knows who the Antichrist is. Many guesses over the course of the faceless this earth, I mean, everybody say, oh, he's going to be Antichrist. It was JFK, it was Obama, it was this person, it was that person. They don't know. And he could be alive today, and with all the guesses, I'm sure you still don't know. But there's going to be certain signs that will accompany his appearing. And again, I pointed some of these out last week, the condition of the world, first of all. We looked at, again, we looked at this a little bit last week, the condition of the world. It's going to be such a moral decay. Uh, we're going to be in a terrible condition. Second Timothy chapter 3, remember that? Paul says in the latter days there's going to be um, all kinds of crazy things that are going on. People are going to be lovers of themselves, um, heady, high-minded. Um, there are a lot of things that those last days are going to look like, and it is not good. They'll have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. But again, you can look that up. I'm not going to go there for sake of time. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And, uh, but we understand also that the world already bears the marks of, of the Antichrist and his coming. Remember I told you in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus there, and the, it's called, the, what is it called, the I forget the term that they call it, but essentially he's giving this sermon on the Mount of Olives, and uh, the, the Olivet Discourse is what it's called. And Jesus tells him, and he says, this is what the last days are going to look like. It's going to be wars and rumors of wars. It's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famines. There's going to be pestilences. And all these signs are going to accompany those end times. It's going to be people who say, here's Christ and there's Christ. Don't believe them, is what Jesus tells them. And again, we've already seen some of these signs come to fruition, and we see just the little, the, the little effects, and we understand that it's coming, it's going to come into the full, it's going to be apostasy, it's going to be anti-Semitism, and other things that's going to be, it's going to define that time period, and we're already seeing it take place in the here and now. And so it's my conviction that the, God is already preparing the world 
for that time period when Satan's Superman is going to appear. Because we're already seeing the signs of that already. And it's moving fuller and fuller until that time. Uh, not only the condition of the world, but the corruption of religion. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 tells us that the Antichrist is going to be associated by, again, the, the falling away, the, the great apostasy, not the apostasy necessarily what, what we're seeing today. Again, the whole deconstruction movement, people moving away from Christ, the moral decay that we're seeing, but it's going to be even worse. It's going to be even worse than what we see, even right now. And you say, Pastor, how could it get worse? But believe me. It can. It's going to be a time when organized, visible religion will depart from the doctrines of the Word of God. Since the New Testament was written for and about believers, it makes sense to conclude that this falling away will be apparent in churches and denominations which operate under the umbrella of Christianity. It will be an erosion of truth and morals. Listen, there was a day in which you could stand up and somebody called themselves a Christian, you would, you would understand what they're talking about. If they called themselves a Christian, you would understand what they're talking about. They believe in the incarnation of Christ. He was virgin born. They said that they were Christian. They believed that uh, Jesus was the Son of God. They would believe that, uh, in the Trinity. They, they would believe in uh, a, a lot of other things that are associated. They would believe that the Bible was indeed the very Word of God. If somebody called themselves a Christian, there were certain things that defined what that term meant. But now today, if you, call, you ask somebody if they're a Christian... They'll call themselves a Christian. They don't even believe the Bible. But yet they're calling themselves a Christian. They say, well, we don't believe that Jesus was virgin born, and they're calling themselves a Christian. They'll deny everything in which we believe is foundational to the truth, and which you and I hold to dear and near unto our hearts. They'll deny the very words of those, and yet they'll call themselves a Christian. You're like, wait a minute, two and two don't go together whatsoever. How could you call yourself a Christian? And it's becoming more and more apparent every single day. And, and people are falling away, and uh, so much so that even, even the Pope are doing, saying things that doesn't even make sense. They're, they're trying to wiggle around this whole homosexual uh, thing right now where he's trying to say, well, you know, you could do the homosexual marriages, but, you know, under certain conditions. Why? Because he's trying to appeal to a lost world. And uh, it seems like it's constantly moving. I need to get off of that topic. But anyway, you see what I'm saying there. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy what we're dealing with in the day and age in which we're living. A person, um, again, at that time, you know, what we're seeing today, a person may doubt that Jesus really died and rose from the dead and claimed that they're saved, but that is not what a Christian is. That is not what a Christian is. You must believe that Jesus was was Jesus, uh, was God coming to flesh. He, he lived a sinless, perfect life on the face of this earth. He fulfilled God's word. He fulfilled God's will. Uh, he did the work of the Father. He went to the cross. He, he took our sins upon his own body. He died upon that tree. And then he was buried and for three days. And then he rose again after that third day. And he showed himself alive of among 500 different witnesses to where there's many infallible proofs. Luke writes this in the book of Acts, to where it was undeniable. Even in the fact that you look at the, the, the Apostle Paul, somebody who was a persecutor to the Jews, you think of anybody who, who would deny Christianity, and yet he turns completely against all of his own convictions he used to hold as a Pharisee, as a Jewish person, and now all of a sudden he's saying, I used to be a denier of the faith, I used to be a blasphemer, but now I thank God upon him who had mercy upon me, who was blind and ignorant, but now I see. And he received Christ as his personal Savior. And we're living in the midst of this great falling away. Cults are growing by leaps and bounds all the day. Uh, we see more and more cropping up and rising to the forefront. And there's more and more fractions of the different denominations every single day. It's amazing. And all the while, our society is not getting any better. The completion, the completion of the church. That's the third thing we find here. Not only the condition of the world, the corruption of religion, the completion of the church. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6-7, through 7, it teaches us um, that the church must be removed before Antichrist can be revealed. Verse 6, you know, he that uh, withholdeth will withhold. Uh, in, in verse 6, let me turn back over there. I don't want to misquote it. 
And I try not to misquote things. Uh, sometimes my memory is not as sharp as what I like it to be. But I don't want to give the, the wrong impression about the verse. It says, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now leadeth will lead until he be taken out of the way. And uh, we, we know uh, what's, what's going on there. We know that the one who's uh, withholding, the one who's letting, is because the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, is we're saved from the wrath to come. I want to hammer that, that verse home to you, okay? I've mentioned it every, every single sermon, well, every single message of the second coming, uh, that we're saved from the wrath to come. It's like... The Bible tells us, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, uh, the, the rains did not come, the floods did not come until Noah was safe on that ark. The church would be caught up out of here, and then that judgment will, will let loose. And that's what he's talking about. The word letteth and withholdeth are the, are the same Greek words. It means to hold back, to hinder, and restrain. And so we know at this, this period of time, the withholding and the restraining has to do with the church being taken out of the way, and the Holy Spirit as well, because every single believer who's been saved by the grace of God, what happens? The, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells that believer, and, and He helps us to walk in the Spirit, walks, walk in the, in the counsels of God, in the Word of God, uh, helps us to be sanctified, helps us to have that, that holiness in our life. Not that we can do it ourselves, but it's what the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, doing in our lives. And that Holy Spirit will be taken, taken up out of the way along with the church as well. The church and the Holy Spirit are the two hindrances to the, Holy Spirit, to the Antichrist coming. So the work of the Spirit in convicting and judging in the hearts of the men is tremendous restraining force in the world. Let me move on here. It's worthy to note that um, the tribulation is not for the church. Again, I already pointed that out in First Thessalonians but we also know in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Uh, it's called a time of Jacob's trouble. A time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, in verse 7, the Bible says, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. It was told to Daniel that the tribulation time was for Israel. And we know at uh, Daniel chapter 12, it says, Michael, the archangel, will stand up and fight for the people of Israel. Um, the tribulation period is also known as the time of God's wrath. Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 through 17. Revelation 16, verse 1. Again, I, I tell you, there's so much wrapped up in this prophecy, and I'm not going to do it justice until I maybe go through one of the... Uh, maybe an Old Testament like Isaiah or maybe Jeremiah and go through it diligently. I'm just kind of giving you an overview of, of, of what all of this takes place. Uh, one of the clearest examples that the church will not be here from the pages of Scripture is Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And so can, you know, between the two passages, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and this Revelation chapter 3 and other passages of Scripture, I don't think it could be clearer. We don't have anything to worry about, but the world has a lot to worry about. Has a lot to worry about. And so many people were deceived. And you try to go and you witness to them and you try to give them the gospel and and you pour your heart out to them, and you say, well, I love you, and I care about you. I'm trying to give you the truth. I want to give you the answers to life. I want you to know that you have a home in heaven. I want you to be saved by the grace of God. I'm trying to help you here, and yet they'll laugh at you in the face. And you pray for me, you pray for me, you pray for them. And they'll try to think of every answer under the sun of why they should not believe the gospel. Again, I mentioned Romans chapter 11, the blindness was happening to Israel in part. You can read that Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 29. 
And uh, in fact, let me turn it over there. I'm just going to read it just so you see what I'm saying. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so that all Israel shall be saved, as is it written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer. Now again, that's the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's when he's going to come and put down all unrighteousness. That's the Prince of Peace who's going to come here to the face of this earth. He shall come out of Sion to deliver and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So when Christ comes again, there's going to be a, a, a day of great salvation for the people of Israel. Verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God without repentance. And again, I mentioned to you that God fully intends to give them the land and fulfill the promises that he's given to the nation of Israel. We want to come back now to Daniel chapter 8, and we see here that uh, the abilities of Satan Superman, and we find this in verse 20, the latter half of verse 23. He's going to be a king of fierce countenance and the understanding dark sentences and shall... Stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. The abilities of Satan's superman, he's going to be a man of popularity. Man of popularity. Revelation 6.2 tells us that this man will be given a crown. You know, he comes riding with his white horse, he'll be given a crown. There's going to be a bow in his hand. He's going to go forth to conquer and to conquer. What is it? Conquer and conquering, something like that. Conquering and to conquer. And the peoples of the world will embrace him as a godsend, and no doubt that this man will arrive on the scene with a workable formula for world peace. Um, so many passages of scriptures to turn to, but uh, we know that when he comes, he's going to promise peace to the nation of Israel. He's going to sign a peace treaty, and then halfway through, he's going to break that peace treaty with them. And so people will turn to him for a period of time. So he'll promise world peace. He'll have a viable explanation for the disappearance of the Christians. He'll embody all the world that's ever looked for in a leader, and he'll be the Antichrist. And he'll possess many different uh, abilities. Leadership of a George Washington. You look at him as he went forth in the battle of George Washington. He was a great military leader as he went forth and the founder of first president of the United States of America, the eloquence of a Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He'll have the charm of Theodore Roosevelt. He'll have the charisma of JFK, the popularity of Dwight Eisenhower. He'll have the political savvy of Lyndon Johnson and the intellect of Thomas Jefferson. And he's going to deceive many. And I've, sometimes I've thought this, maybe I shouldn't think this, but in my mind, you know the guy that plays Jesus on The Chosen, Jonathan Rumi? I mean, people are looking to that guy. He's very popular. Um, he's met with the Pope on several different occasions. You, you look at him. Uh, he, he wears this ring on his finger with a skull on it and things like this. I'm like, wow, that's strange. And uh, he's so popular. I'm like, man, maybe that's the Antichrist. But we don't know. We don't know. He'll be a man of, again, he'll be a man of peace. A man of peace. He'll go forth to conquer, to conquer. And uh, Daniel 8, 23, is a king of fierce countenance. So first part of the tribulation period will be marked by peace. We find that also in Daniel 9, 27. Um, that might be the passage of Scripture that I was looking for. Daniel 9, 27. He shall confirm the covenant. Here it is. Yeah, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. He's talking about the seven-year tribulation period. And in the midst of that week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. It'll be like the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. And for overspreading of the abomination, she shall make desolate. There it is. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. 
And so he'll go in. Again, he's trying to exalt himself to be a god and he'll go into the temple and uh, he'll defile the temple and he'll be, try to be worshipped as God. And essentially that's what he's, he's trying to, he'll go against that peace treaty that he makes with the people. The world will never know peace apart from Jesus Christ. That's, that's couldn't be emphasized enough. And while this world is in turmoil, the children of God know peace in their hearts. Jesus says in John 14, 27, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, uh, but I'm going to give you my peace. My peace. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And so when Jesus returns to this earth, he's going to usher in genuine peace. He's going to be a man of prosperity. Great wealth. I mean, how could you not? Just when you look at the tribulation period, what, what Antichrist is going to do is just, people are going to be looking for money. It reminds me of the time where Joseph was on the face of this earth and he, everybody had to come to him to get their, uh, their food, their, what they needed. Because of the seven years of famine, and they came to Joseph looking to buy, and he sold all their properties to get that, and they were servants unto them. be essentially what Antichrist does because of the famine that's on the face of this earth. And uh, he's going to control the world money. And um, let me move on. He'll be a man of power. Man of power. Revelation 13, 7 through 8 tells us the Antichrist will eventually rule the entire world. He'll conquer down through the ages. That's his, really his success and his goal. You hear Joe Biden, he, he would say, he says, my one goal in life was to be president of the United States. Well, Antichrist's one goal in this world is to rule over the world. But men won't care or recognize the fact. They'll worship him. They'll worship him. And all of this will be true of him in the beginning of his reign. They'll come to him. But in the midst of the tribulation, he'll show his true colors. And uh, the abominations, the third point here, the abominations of Satan, Superman, verses 24 and 25 of our our text. I'm trying not to go too fast, but I'm. Just, I understand that there's a lot of information here. His power should be mighty, but not by his own power. He just should destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. Again, you read over in Revelation how he'll do these signs and wonders. He shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And uh, so that's what Daniel sees. We understand that through the tribulation period, he's going to attack the people of God. There's a lot of imagery that goes in through there. Revelation chapter 12 is one that people stumble over quite a bit. Um, because there's going to be this woman and, you know, he has a son and they go into the wilderness and she's chased by the dragon. It's just imagery. Imagery was going on. Essentially, Antichrist is going to try to chase uh, Israel and try to destroy them and stamp them out from the face of the earth. God will protect them uh, through that period of time. But he will attack the people of God. He will attack the place of God. You know, as I mentioned, the abomination of desolation mentioned in Daniel chapter 8, 25 here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. All these verses tell us that Antichrist will make, break the seven-year treaty that he makes with them. Again, he's going to come. He's going to try to wipe out Israel from the face of this earth, and he's going to come in. He's going to defile that temple. He's going to uh, war, be, try to be worshipped. He's going to sit upon the throne there within the temple and declare himself to be God and demand worship from all the people, but especially the Jews, as he desecrates the temple. Again, remember I told you he's going to be like Antioch Epiphanes. Antioch, he, he, was, a, he was a Syrian, a man of great power and great strength. He came to the throne in 175 B.C., 164 uh, B.C. D during that period of time and uh, really persecuted the Jewish people to no end really caused all kinds of atrocities to the Jewish people. And, you know, in fact, he murdered over 40,000 people in a three-day period. 40,000 people. Can you believe that? Sold many of them into slavery and really committed all these horrendous things that he did. Hard to believe that a person could do that. Their hearts have to really be hardened to do something like that. And then uh, he began to act out against the temple and began to defile. He went into the temple, and what he did was he took a pig and he offered it, and he 
upon the altar, and then he took that blood and he defiled the whole temple with that blood. And he tried to cause the priest to eat from that, that, that pig because, you know, the pig, you, they, don't, they don't eat, Jewish people don't eat pigs. They don't eat bacon. They don't eat any of that thing. That's this how horrendous the Antioch Epiphanes was. And, uh, you know, how the Bible tells us the Antichrist, he's not going to have affection toward women. Antioch Epiphanes was that kind of guy. He, he was atro- atrocious in all the ways that you could think of. And um, he would cause these people to worship upon all these different kinds of altars. But then there came a guy who just, he wouldn't stand for it. He wouldn't stand for it. So he came up and he led a revolt against uh, Antioch Epiphanes and his, his armies. And for a while he prevailed. And there was a feast of dedications. Why? Because he, he put oil upon the lamp and it was supposed to run dry, but yet it didn't run dry for the seven. I mean, there's, again, there's a lot. That's wrapped up in that time period, but it was only in part, only in part what Antichrist would do. I hope I'm not overwhelming you with this information, okay? He will attack the Prince of God. Not only will he demand to be worshipped, and he'll control the world, but he'll attack the Prince of God. Now, how can you attack Jesus Christ when he comes here and he touches down on the Mount of Olives, and then the whole world is coming against the fight against Jesus Christ. Jesus will destroy him. The Bible tells us here, he'll destroy him without hand. Again, like uh, Daniel chapter 2, with the image of the, uh, the one made of gold and silver and, and brass and, um, was it, lead and clay. And it'll be broken without hand. It, He'll come, and Jesus Christ will come, and he'll set up his, his, his kingdom. Antichrist cannot prevent him from coming and taking the world back unto himself or setting up the kingdom or, or, or saving the Jewish people. Antichrist can't do anything to stop him from all of this. And um, Jesus will, will, will ultimately prevail. I wanted to mention this. The voice you follow is the voice that you worship and serve. The voice you follow is the voice you worship and serve. Now, during this tribulation period, there's going to be a lot of people that's going to follow the voice of Antichrist. There's going to be 144,000 Jewish male men, virgins, who are going to be preaching the gospel. Again, we're going to have the two witnesses who will come and they'll preach the gospel. They'll be slain in the streets and left there three days and then risen up into the heavens. We'll have the two angels that will come giving the gospel. Antichrist can't stop the gospel from being proclaimed, but he can try to do everything he can to stomp out the name of Jesus Christ. And today, in the day in which you and I are living, it's, it's already beginning. They're trying to do everything they can to silence the voice of the church and getting the gospel out to seeing people saved by the grace of God. And, and so much so, as I told you before, even they try to prevent chaplains from praying in the name of Jesus. Or even if you go into, even into Congress and they invite you to pray in Congress, they try to keep you from praying in the name of Jesus. Why? Because Satan will do everything. He doesn't want to hear the name Jesus. He wants all the worship. And there'll be afflictions, and ultimately, Antichrist will be defeated. It'll be sudden, it'll be serious, and it'll be very great. Let me close with this illustration here. Vance Havner says this, Our world is fast becoming a madhouse, and the inmates are trying to run the asylum. It's a strange time where the patients are writing the prescriptions. The students are threatening to run the schools, the children to manage the homes, and the church members not the Holy Spirit to, or not allowing the Holy Spirit to direct the churches. Such lawlessness always brings a dictator, and the last of the line will be Antichrist, now in the offing waiting his cue to come and take the throne. And it's true. It's the upending of all things. God created everything with order. Antichrist will come and bring disorder into this world. Uh, If you have any comments or questions, I, I I can take any questions later. Maybe maybe if you have any questions or something, you say, Pastor, will you explain this better to me? Maybe you write down on a piece of paper some questions and you turn it in and maybe I can address some of those uh, in the coming weeks, okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time together. Lord, I, I pray that I don't confuse anybody. 
but I pray that this would make sense and that it would be well defined from your scriptures. Lord, we, if we can't back anything up by scriptures, then it's not, it can't be true. And so, Lord, we pray and we thank you for this time together. And may you just bless this time to come for the morning service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.